Good morning, church. I want to welcome you again to our online service and I want to thank you for joining us again this week for worship. Uh, we're going to get started here with a couple announcements. There's a couple things that I want to make sure you're aware of. Uh, if you're a member of Northern Hills Church, then you'll remember getting an email about an online survey uh, that we created and have asked you to fill out. And so we just want to remind all the members of Northern Hills or anyone that's been watching these online services regularly uh, to fill out that survey for us. Uh, if you didn't get that, you can send an email here to info at northernhillschurch.ca uh, and we can send you that. If you've been watching every week, we'd love to hear from you. But the leadership of the church uh, is kind of just looking for some uh, feedback in regards to how we move forward with these services and, and especially what we're going to do in the fall. So please just take a few minutes if you can uh, to give us some feedback. The second thing is in regards to our church picnics. Uh, you'll remember last Sunday I was talking about our church picnics and actually we had a great time uh, at the park last week. Thank you to everyone who came. It was amazing to see some of your faces again in person and just to spend, spend time and to feel normal and to feel like a church again for the first time in a long time. It was a great time. If you didn't get the chance to do that last weekend and the good news is we have another one coming up next weekend. Uh, and actually, originally it was scheduled for next Sunday, uh, July the 26th, but we're going to go ahead and move that for next weekend to Saturday. There are some people that couldn't come on Sunday, so for this next one, next weekend, on July the 25th, it's a Saturday, we're going to meet at noon at the same location as last weekend. And so if you need that location, uh, go ahead and send an email here to the church and we'll let you know exactly where we're meeting. But please plan next Saturday at noon to come together to be in person with your church family. For some of us, we haven't seen each other's faces for so long, and it was an extremely rich experience just to sit around in lawn chairs, eat some food, visit, uh, enjoy the sunshine. Uh, thankfully, we avoided a massive thunderstorm, which is kind of our daily activity here in Calgary now, as you know. <laughs> um, but please plan to come next weekend. Uh, as we get started in worship here, I actually am going to do something a bit different this week for our interview. Uh, I don't have somebody who has, has their interview ready yet to share with you. And so this week, actually, the Roberts family is going to interview um, and share some things with you. And it might seem kind of strange for the pastor to interview because uh, you've been seeing my face. You've been hearing from me every single week. Uh, some of you for years, you've, you've been hearing from me for uh, on a weekly basis. But there are some things that I think would be helpful for us to share about our family, how we've been doing throughout all of this, um, some things uh, that you might not know about us, and then actually some of the ways that I was influenced in my walk with God that I probably haven't shared with you. I've had a pretty mixed experience since all of this started, uh, both positive and negative. I'd say at first, uh, with all the kids out of school and less things to do as a family, all of us kind of trapped in our house. It was pretty neat, actually, the the time we got to spend with one another. Chelsea and I got to start some family traditions with the kids that we've kind of talked about for a long time and really never had time to do. Uh, but obviously, four or five months in here, uh, that's turned into a challenge sometimes with all six of us in a house, uh, finding things to do. There's lots of energy in the house and limited things uh, to do with that energy but we have found some things to do uh, recently I've gotten the kids into archery I've got them shooting a bow which is one of my passions so that's been really fun uh, we started to build some things we built some tables we rearranged our whole house uh, we've gone on fishing trip we've gone on a camping trip uh, a couple things about me you might not know are that I'm terrified of flying uh, in fact, actually, even at the age of 39, when Chelsea and I take off in an airplane, I still reach over and need to hold her hand most times as we're taking off. Uh, unfortunately for her, my hand is usually pretty sweaty as well, but um, I just absolutely hate flying and would be very happy to never ever get in an airplane for the rest of my life. Uh, another thing is that I'm a crier. I, I'm actually, I, can, I cry very easily. Um, you've maybe seen some of that on Sundays in the past. Um, but watching movies, listening to a good song, hearing difficult stories, um, I'm pretty easily moved to tears. I'll share something fun about Chelsea as well, since I'm pretty sure you already knew those things about me. Um, but most of you probably don't know that when Chelsea was in high school in Estevan, Saskatchewan, she was a member of her cheerleading squad. And so Chelsea was a cheerleader in high school. I didn't actually know her then, but I have seen a video 
uh, of her performing and so there is video evidence uh, I'm sorry I did try to actually get a hold of that in our storage boxes somewhere but I don't think uh, it's ac accessible anymore I'd love to have shared that with you this morning I'm going to go ahead and cheat a little bit with this question this morning and I'm going to give you three names uh, and the reason for that is because as I got thinking of all the, the names of people who have influenced me over the years uh, the list got quite long but there were these three names really stood out uh, of people who impacted me significantly in very unique ways you might be surprised as I share these three names with you that none of them are my wife Chelsea or my mom and my dad and the reason for that is because I've shared lots of stories in the past about their tremendous impact uh, on my faith but I really want to pay tribute uh, to these three men. Uh, all three are members of Glen Elm Church of Christ still today, uh, but I w they were part of my life when I was a member of Glen Elm Church of Christ in Regina in my early 20s. The first person I want to pay tribute to is Ed Sloka. Uh, Ed and I became pretty good friends, and he influenced me in many different ways. Uh, but I recall one night that he said something to me that altered the direction of my life. It altered my relationship with God. It was actually the night that I led worship for a church for the very first time. So it was the first time that I ever got on stage with an acoustic guitar and led people in worship. And I was really insecure about it. I was really nervous. I was so happy when it all ended. And I even was so happy because I thought, I'm never going to do that again. Um, until Ed came and talked to me. Ed came and just for a couple minutes, he shared an encouragement with me. He just encouraged me. Ed was one of those people, uh, and he still is one of those people, who's just full of joy and enthusiasm. His smile lights up a room. His smile makes you feel better about yourself. Um, but Ed came up to me, and, and for two minutes, he just praised me and, and encouraged me uh, to continue doing what uh, I had just done, leading worship. And I went very quickly from feeling like, I'm so glad that's over. I never want to do that again, to thinking, I can't wait. I can't wait to do that again. I need to try that again. <laughs> um, Ed, through simple encouragement, changed the, my, the direction of my life and my relationship with God. I think it's a great example of the ways in which, I don't know if you've ever felt like, oh, I should go and encourage this person. I should go say this to this person to encourage them. Uh, I think often we have those feelings and we don't do it. We kind of maybe feel like that's a little bit awkward. But I want to, I want to encourage you. Uh, when you have those feelings or you have those thoughts about someone, please go and share that with them. It could change their life. The second person I want to pay tribute to is Richard Krogsgaard. Uh, I remember many times when I was attending Glen Elm Church where without using any words, I remember just being floored by the intimacy that Richard had with God. Uh, whether it was looking across the room, watching him worship on a Sunday morning, whether it was being in some sort of meeting or gathering and, and listening to him pray, whether it was listening to him share about his experiences traveling to Africa and serving uh, the people there. Uh, there was just this very clear uh, display of a passionate love for God and an intimate relationship with him. And it, it really changed uh, my whole life because I started to long for that. I wanted that. Richard would rarely share without having tears in his eyes when he talked about God, when he spoke to God, when he worshipped God. And it just really made me long for that. And I still long for that today. It still influences me today. The third person or people that had great influence in my life are Wilf and Laura Olson. Uh, Wilf and Laura are an incredible couple. I was good friends with their son in high school and about 19 years ago when I first moved to Regina, they gave me a place to live and I'm pretty sure I still owe them some rent money for that. Wilf and Laura are the reason that I started attending Glen Elm Church, which is the first church that I had attended for years since I lived with my parents. Uh, but not only are they the reason that I started attending that church, they're the reason that as I was attending that church, I for the first time started to grasp and understand that God is alive in his people and he's alive in his church. Um, I, I, for the first time, saw this picture of, of God's presence in his people. And, and that was through the way that they live their lives. Wolf and Laura are both quiet people. It's not through things that they said. It's just the way that they lived their lives. When I think of Wolf and Laura, I think of people who, without any doubt, anyone that knows them would, would say they're incredibly caring people. They're generous. Uh, they're supportive. They're loving. They're accepting. And in these, in these different ways, uh, they really transformed and changed my life. We're going to go ahead and enter into worship now. But before we do that, I want to lead us 
in prayer. So let's go ahead. If you'll join me, let's pray with one another and then let's praise God's holy name. Uh, God, we are so grateful. Uh, despite being at home right now alone, we're so grateful through your Holy Spirit that right now we are together. We are unified through your Spirit. And God, right now we all together, uh, we come to your throne. We bow before you to praise your holy name.
Kathy and I went camping in the woods a couple weekends ago. And on that trip, I was reminded of how beautiful nature is, how terrifying the dark is, and how much work it is to start a fire and keep it going. During one particularly frustrating attempt to get our fire started, I asked Kathy how forest fires can burn up millions of acres of land in a summer. But here I was on my 10th match and still couldn't get the bark to catch. Despite the setbacks, starting, tending, and staring into the fire are my favorite aspects of camping. And I think that it started at a young age. I grew up in a candle-friendly home, and sometimes, on particularly dark and scary nights, my parents would light a candle and place it in a little ceramic house candle holder. There were strict rules. No touching, just looking. As I was laying in bed, I would stare at the candlelight dancing in the house and watch the shadows flickering on the wall. And mesmerized as I was, I would drift off to sleep. My parents must have snuck in at that time and put the candle out because it was never burning in the morning. Now, looking back, I see how much they trusted us and how lucky we were that one night when everything went wrong. But before I go further into that story, how is your practice of Sabbath going? Have you started to picture it as more than just a day off from your job? Are you practicing sabbatical memory by remembering who God is and who you are on Sabbath? Have you taken that step of faith and rested for 24 hours after six days of work? I have been, and it's made a difference. My stress levels are lower. I feel closer to my wife, and I'm able to be more present in my work and in my play. I am allowing myself one day to be with God, my wife, and friends. And I find myself looking forward to it and enjoying the memories of it throughout the week. And most significantly, these are guilt-free moments of rest. Sabbath is a gift given to me by my Father in heaven. And as such, I don't do anything to earn it. Now, as you practice Sabbath, you will inevitably come across the same problems people have had for millennia past in their pursuit of the rest of God. You already have or will soon ask, what am I allowed to do on Sabbath? What do I have to avoid? To answer this, we're going to look at a passage from the book of Numbers that has troubled me more than any other regarding Sabbath. The first five books of the Bible each reveal a different aspect of the specific moment in Israel's history that we call the Exodus. Genesis explains why Israel was in Egypt to begin with. Exodus explains how they exited Egypt. Leviticus outlines what righteousness will look like and how sinful people can still commune with a holy God now that they've left. And Deuteronomy is a retelling of the events in those other four books so that they stay relevant for Israel over the next 600 years. But Numbers explains how Yahweh brought Israel to the edge of the land he had promised them where they could see with their own eyes the bountiful trees and the fertile soil. And it took two people to carry back one cluster of grapes. That's how abundant they were. Everything was bigger in the promised land, including the people. And the people of Israel were scared and lost faith. Their God, who had turned the Nile River to blood, He couldn't handle this. Their God, who had single-handedly destroyed Pharaoh's famed chariots by collapsing the walls of water that he held back, this was too big for him. So they rebelled against Yahweh. They formed a committee to decide how to get back to Pharaoh and work as slaves again. Because at least there, they would be safe. And it wasn't just a small group. It was every man or boy of fighting age that stood quaking in their boots and refused 
to go one step further, the great Moses included. So Yahweh decided that those males of fighting age would never enter the promised land. They would wander around aimlessly in the wilderness for 40 years while every one of those males died, except for Joshua and Caleb. And then the next generation would go in and enjoy the land. Then, right after that decision has been made in Numbers 14, there comes this enigmatic story about a man who goes out gathering sticks on the Sabbath. Now, here it is in Numbers 15, verses 32 to 36. It reads, While the Israelites were in the wilderness, a man was found gathering wood on the Sabbath day. Those who found him gathering wood brought him to Moses and Aaron and the whole assembly, and they kept him in custody because it was not clear what should be done to him. Then the Lord said to Moses, The man must die. The whole assembly must stone him outside the camp. So the assembly took him outside the camp and stoned him to death, as the Lord commanded Moses. While they were in the wilderness. It is an odd way to start this story, because we know that Israel has been in the wilderness for quite some time already. But the writer wants to connect this story back to the previous block of narrative in Numbers 14, where Yahweh decreed that all males 20 years and older would die in the wilderness. This man was found gathering wood, presumably to start a fire, and the people were unsure if this was an action that should be punished. So they held him in custody until Moses could ask Yahweh what to do. I find it quite interesting that they were confused. The law is quite clear. Yahweh had already told them twice that if anyone does any work on the Sabbath, they are to be put to death. But they were confused over whether or not what he was doing counts as work. And I think it's a confusion that we share with them. How do we know what counts as work on the Sabbath? Here are three questions to help determine if an activity is work or rest. The first is whether or not you feel drained or refilled with the activity. Remember young Jamie, mesmerized by the dancing candle in my bedroom? Well, one night, we enjoyed that candle a little too much. No doubt we were inspired by some character on TV carrying around a torch to light their way through the dark. So we rolled up a piece of paper, nice and tight, and we shoved it in through one of the windows. As expected, the paper caught fire, and we had our own little torch. We marched out onto the upstairs landing of our home, and I don't know how this happened, but somehow that burning paper ended up on the carpet, and it caught fire. Now, I was just a little kid at the time, but I knew that fire did not like water. So I rushed to the bathroom, climbed up onto the toilet, and started filling a cup with water. Somewhere between climbing off the toilet and rushing over to the crime scene, my full cup of water splashed around. And when I got there, it was reduced to half full, if that. But I went back to the bathroom, climbed up onto the toilet again, and did it again and again until that fire was put out. It took me twice as long because of all the water that I lost, but I got the job done. Now, look at that cup of water as your own reservoir of energy. When you're energized, it's near full. When you're drained, it's near empty. You carry that reservoir of energy around with you and use it, sometimes unintentionally, by being around people or in situations that drain you, and other times intentionally, putting out the hopefully figurative fires in your life. Either way, your reservoir is depleting slowly as that energy is shared through the day-to-day -day stresses that you have. And you have a limited capacity before you run out of energy altogether. And it's not just bad things that drain you. Good, 
God-inspired activities drain your energy as well. And when you run out, there will be consequences. So to determine if an activity should be considered work or rest, Ask yourself if you feel more drained or refilled after doing it. If it feels neutral, then throw it in the work column, because you can usually tell when they're being refilled. It will help to think back over the last couple of months and identify the times you felt most alive. What were you doing? Who were you doing it with? These are good indicators that this is an activity that fills you up. Likewise, Think back over those activities that drained you. What were you doing? Who were you with? That, too, will help you to determine if an activity is work or rest. The activities that refill you are rest. The activities that drain you are work. You have six days to do those and one day to refill with your rest. Now, a second question you can ask yourself is, What's my motivation? Am I doing this because I want to be more productive? Productivity is not wrong, but it's not for the Sabbath. Sabbath is a break from productivity in all its forms. The Sabbath breaker in our passage this morning was gathering wood. A Hebrew verb here used connotes gathering small dried up twigs or dead bushes. Perfect for fire building. It doesn't seem like he was gathering walking sticks so that his family could go out on a nature walk and enjoy creation. No, he was going to build a fire and probably to cook a meal. Both of these were expressly forbidden on the Sabbath by Yahweh. Now, later on, the Jews went on to create more and more Sabbath rules that were designed to protect people from unintentionally doing work on the Sabbath. An example of this was limiting how many steps you could take away from your home before it was considered work. But these were additions to the actual legal commands from Yahweh, and they acted as a sort of fence around the Sabbath. The thought process was, to avoid work, don't do anything that even resembles work. But this legalistic approach actually becomes more onerous than beneficial especially because you become more worried about working than you are about resting. So don't forget Jesus' words. Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Don't reduce it to a list of things you can't do, but test yourself and examine if what you're doing is rest or work. A great example of this is my bicycle. I commute to work on it, often throughout the six days I take to work. That means on my seventh day of rest, I won't use it to commute. I will use it to take a slow meandering bike ride around my neighborhood or a park, reminding myself that I'm not in a rush to get anywhere. I'm just here to enjoy the present. Others who like to ride their bikes but don't get to do it often during the week may feel energized by going for a 10, 20, 30 kilometer bike ride on their Sabbath. And that's okay. The same activity could be work for me and rest for them. We just have to test our motivations. Reading for pleasure is a great Sabbath activity. Reading to learn a new skill, while beneficial, is productivity oriented, and thus is work. Same activity, But the motivation determines if it's rest or work. Now, the last question you can ask to determine the status of an activity is, am I doing this as a slave or a saint? Sabbath is designed to rework our own view of ourselves so that we realize we're children of God and thus saints, not slaves. Now, if you're a saint, don't go back to life as a slave. There's one last interpretive key hidden in this text that illustrates this. The Hebrew word translated gathering wood is the exact same verb used by Pharaoh to describe the labor of the Israelite slaves as they gathered straw to make bricks. The Israelites were just scheming about ways to get back to Egypt to resume their old labor 
So it seems that this verb choice is intentional. This man has decided to go back to his life as a slave and gather straw on the Sabbath instead of accepting the gift of rest given to him by Yahweh. He would rather live as a slave than as a saint. So anything that is tied to being a slave instead of a saint is work. Remember last week's discussion of the false self and the three foundational lies we hide behind? The lie of performance, the lie of people pleasing, and the lie of control? Well, these lies keep us anchored in our identity as slaves to sin. And that is work. The activity we do on the Sabbath needs to undermine those lies, not reinforce them. That's why we need to stay away from productivity, away from pleasing others, and instead choose to please God, and to recognize that He's in control, not us. Any activity that reinforces the lies of the false self are taboo on the Sabbath. Slaves, they work out of obligation, but saints, they rest in freedom. So avoid any activity that is obligatory, anything that makes demands on your time. Your time is free on the Sabbath. Sabbath is the time in your week that you step out of those regular demands of your life and you enjoy God in the present. Now, that burnt chunk of carpet in my childhood home stayed there, crusty and burnt, until the carpet was torn out and replaced during renovations. You don't need to wait until your own experience of burnout to start practicing Sabbath. Understand what is work and what is rest for you. And now structure your life so that you have a healthy rhythm of both. Six days you shall work, and on the seventh you shall rest. And on that seventh day, take some time to remember Jesus and all that he did, is doing, and will do for you. Now, we practice our own communal recollection of Christ in his death and resurrection. We may be separate from each other, but by taking the bread and the cup, we are joining together, not only with each other, but with Christians from every tribe and language and nation and people throughout the 20 centuries between Jesus' day and ours, as we meet with Jesus right now through his spirit and the practice of communion. So wherever you are and whoever you're with, take the bread, the body of Christ, broken for you, so that you would no longer be a slave to sin, but would rise in freedom as a saint in Christ. Take now and eat. And the cup, the blood of Jesus shed for you to wash away all stain of iniquity and present you as holy and blameless before the Father. Take now and drink.
thank you again for joining us this morning for worship. We're going to go ahead and enter into our time of prayer now to conclude our service. And so we encourage you to spend the next five to ten minutes in prayer in your individual homes. Have a great week.